Welcome back to the History of Rock. His name is Brandon. He's the DJ. His name is Shim. He is the rock star. Class <laughs> is in session. And we're doing Hands. part two now of Alice in Chains Dirt. Which, uh, yeah. if you missed the last episode, I love this album front to back. I could listen to this thing over and over and over again. That's not quite Shim's jam. He doesn't hate no. Alice in Chains. He doesn't necessarily hate the album. It's just, eh, it's not really what he's looking for. It's so, simple. I respect Alice in Chains and I don't like them. And if you can't handle that, then you can't handle this fucking podcast. Ooh, <laughs> face. Yes. Uh, okay, so real quick, the album was released again September 29th, 1992. It had five <laughs> singles on it. Wood, Them Bones, Angry Chair, Rooster, and Down in a Hole. All of those you still hear on the radio to this day. And remember, mm. um, I think we're going to get to this because we're going to do a kind of a track-by-track track listing here, um, it, like breakdown of these songs. And I think I made a note in Rooster where, um, yeah, I, may, I say that this was the one where my wife and I, we went to go see Alice in Chains. Um, she kept, like, every song, is this Rooster? Is this Rooster? <laughs> and I'm like, no, yeah. dear. This is not. I'm like, it's going to be one of the last songs they play. Because one of the things that I'll do when I see a band is I'll kind of see what their playlist was. going, you know, right. the, you know So you kind of see what, you get a feel for the, the what you're going to get for the yeah. performance. And yeah, Rooster so you can is time usually, drinking to it. Yeah, so Rooster's generally yeah, one of those songs they play later, and yeah, so I'm like, no, it's going to be later, it's going to be later. And then when it finally came yeah. on, I kind of looked at her, and she was like, what? And I'm like, this is it, this is Rooster, because you know, it starts out super, super quiet. Oh, yeah, Woo! it's super chill. Yeah. Yeah, they come to... No, see, I can... Thank you. Whatever. Thank we're you gonna for dive right that. into but anyway, this bad boy. But we're going to track one, them bones. Yeah, gonna end up a big old bag of them bones. So it says here the chromatic sh- uh, chromatic riff is played in a time signature seven eight, except for the chorus, which is in four four. Now, in an interview in 1998, Cantrell said, "Quote: I really don't know where that comes from. It just comes naturally to me. I could sit down and figure it out, but what's the use? Off time stuff is just more exciting." It takes people by surprise when you shift gears like that before they even know what the hell hit them. It's also effective when you slow something down, then slam them into the dash. A lot of Alice stuff is written that way. Them Bones is a great off-time song. Sounds like he wants you to listen to his music when you're driving at all times. <laughs> <laughs> it's so do you ever music. do you ever write do you ever write like that? Where it's you know the off time stuff and in like kind of the mentality that Cantrell does or No, I, I literally go I, that's, wow. <laughs> I got to no, take the um, digs, man. I think, no, for me, I always just go with, this is why I respect Alice and Shane's again, goes, it goes in line with what they were saying. He's riding that way because he wants to take the audience on a specific ride. I don't want to take him on that ride. So I do different things. But if I ever wanted to fuck him up, if I ever was like, oh, I want to confuse people and then slow it down and then hit him with the dash. I don't know why the dash is a thing, but like then I would use odd time signatures if that was the ride I want to take him on. And when I do a prog rock metal thing, then I'll do that shit. I wrote a couple of things with Jamie because he knows how to do that, where we built it like that because he knows how to do seven, eight that goes into 16, four, that then drops into a four, four chorus or whatever. Cause Jamie's talented. So, Cause he's talented. And I've never said I was talented. Never once have I said, I've never even claimed to be a musician. When people ask me if I'm a musician, I'm like, no, I can't read music. So I'm not a musician. Jamie's a musician. He's talented. Going back to dirt. No, on the lyrics, are, Cantrell the said, on the lyrics, on the lyrics, Cantrell said, it's a little sarcastic, but <laughs> it's <laughs> <laughs> on the lyrics, Cantrell said, it's a little sarcastic, but it's pretty much about dealing with your mortality and life everybody's going to die someday no way that's where alice in chains is coming from you never could have told from the way their fucking music sounds instead of being afraid of it that's the way it is so enjoy the time you've got live as much as you can have as much fun as possible face your fears and live they must have gotten to that realization on the next album <laughs> well it's, yeah, it's always interesting like hearing something like that from cantrell because he Remember, actually, if you wanted to, you can always go back to that uh, Rockstar 101 episode, too, where he was in Texas, and he went over to Dimebag Daryl's house, and that was the one where he showed up with the really nice Cadillac, and Dimebag then proceeded to essentially destroy the whole thing. That's in an old episode of uh, go, go ahead Rockstar 101. That. Yeah, It's still up there, Spotify, Apple, Google, you guys could find it. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's interesting with how dark the lyrics are, and how dark this entire album is, and, and how deep everything goes into 
And when he talks about them bones, which is we're going to end up a big old bag of them bones, he's kind of like, yeah, it's like we're, we're more or less kind of poking at it. Where it's like, yeah, that's yeah. going to happen someday. But rather yeah. than than uh, stressing over it or being overly concerned about it, live in the moment, live in the now. But then yeah. you almost had Lane Staley on the complete opposite side, like I mentioned in the last episode, where you know my my old boss, he mentioned yeah. with him, like he just you could tell he didn't want to be there, like he was just yeah. in this whole other other world. And the more that I researched the band, the more it kind of blew my mind that they were a a band. You know what I mean? Because it's did it, they it, survive that long? Did they go through? I mean, kind of a little bit because it, it it felt like they were such opposites when it came to a lot of things. But mm. at least for me, it, it created a great album. For Shim, it created the worst album of all time. It's but, oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> Kidding. Next one. So uh, track worst two. album of all time is Alice's Restaurant. Just putting that out there. Okay, so going back to the damn river. Oh, look at this! <laughs> look at this! All right, so maybe you're curious what the hell just happened, why there was a blip. Shim and I got through like 20 more minutes of the episode, and when I looked over, it stopped recording. For some reason, it recorded like the first six minutes of the episode, and then it just stopped. So I'm hoping that this continues, and we it ended... <laughs> It ended right at Jim saying Alice's Restaurant is the worst which album is, of all time. Which is not true. I don't actually believe that. That was a joke. So it's nice because there was a moment afterwards that was like, that's a joke. Ha ha. And then it didn't catch it. <laughs> no, he's kidding. He's serious about Alice's Restaurant being the worst Alice's album of all Restaurant time. Alice's Restaurant is an amazing record. Anyway, let's go back so to like, Alice's Chains. Yeah, we're going to dive. We're going to dive right it back in here. Uh, so now we'll pick it up at uh, track two, Damn That River. And it says... The only thing I was able to find on this one is that Cantrell was inspired to write the song after a fight with Sean Kinney in which uh, Kinney broke a coffee table over his head. Which is great. That's a did good things ever get that song. heated with the puppies? Did Emma ever break no, a coffee table I was, about, I was thinking the same head? thing. But the, half the reason we just privately hated each other and kept it all deep, deep inside. And so, no, we well, never got to that situation. It's so boring, dude. How, it was so how, boring. How, how long did, did, did Most that of the time. happen? For, even from for the years. get-go? Because... No, no, not the get-go, but from, like, after after Dressed Up As Life, there was some, sh yeah, some, like, once we were on tour for a couple of years, everything that's wrong with a relation, everything that's wrong with a relationship gets blown out of proportion. Everything becomes way more stressful, way more tense. Everything that you don't like about being on tour becomes a really big deal. Everything that you like about being on tour is not really as important because it gets overshadowed by being tired and being fucking like sick of the same food and everything. There's no break. There's no like, hey, it's the weekend. So we, we got two days off work. There is no break. So if when, when you explain to people, hey, we had this problem in the band, after the fact, you're like, that's not that big a deal. But when you're in it for years, it becomes a big deal. And Did the you problem is you can't you can't diminish it because you go, oh, it wasn't a big deal in reality because that is your reality. You're the one living it. Well, yeah, you and, know, and that, that becomes your reality. So it is very real. Now, did you ever yeah, do so anything it's real that you at regret? The time. Did I do anything that I regret? Anything that you no. would like to apologize for right now? No. No? We're not going to cleanse? No. No, I've got no, my cleansing has been done, brother. This is why I don't even talk about the puppies anymore. I am cleansed. I am clean, brother. I'm doing nothing great new shit. Nothing wrong with that. Now it's time to roll right back into track three, Rain When I Die. Rain When I Die. Cantrell talked about a lot of the songs dealing with drug use, but the whole album is not necessarily the same theme. He said, Rain When I Die is a song to a girl. Simple song, right off to a girl. For some reason called it Rain When I Die. And that's the end of that one. Track Again, four. I could listen to this album over and over and over again. Not, I could it's really, really, like, it's really weird album. too. Like I've never even like been around heroin in real life, but there's just something about that. I've the, seen this one song. person shoot up. I've seen one person do it. Are we still recording? Just make yeah. sure we're still recording. Yeah, oh yeah, hell yeah. I've seen one person shoot up speed and it made me not want to ever shoot up in my, it was before I got into drugs anyway. I was like 13, 14. I had never had a drink. I had never taken any, I don't had a smoke. I hadn't done anything. And there was this kid that was, a friend of a girl that I was into. So I was over at the girl's place, but we weren't dating yet. And there was this other guy there who was a junkie and he injected speed right in front of me. And then he suddenly changed. So it was not heroin, but I remember him suddenly changing. And I was like, fuck, this is weird. 
that's really not cool. Like, I, it wasn't you, glamorous yeah. to me at all. Yeah, because he also looked all junked out. And not, it wasn't glamorous. There was no fucking Alice in Chains playing. There was no cool trippy lights making it look glam. It was just two o'clock in the afternoon. Hey, I'm coming over. I need somewhere to shoot up. And he did it in the living room and then fucked off again. And I was like, Ugh, Ugh. not cool. Jesus. All yeah. right. Down in a hole. Here we go. Track four. Here Alice in Chains Dirt. <laughs> <laughs> that guy was down in a hole. Well, the song yeah. was written by Cantrell to his longtime girlfriend, Courtney Clark. Uh, in the liner notes of the 1990, uh, 1999 Music Bank box set, he said, Down in a hole's in my top three, personally. It's to my longtime love. It's the reality of my life, the path I've chosen in a weird way. It kind of foretold where we are right now. It's hard for, both, uh, for us both to understand that this life is not conducive to much success in long-term relationships. You want to pin that one. Cantrell was originally hesitant about presenting the song to the band because he felt it might be too soft, but it was well received and they moved forward to record it. Now, I never, I, what, how do we get, how do Here, we, what, here's, what okay, yeah, so here's the problem. So we missed all of this recording because I asked Jim, has there ever been yeah. something that with the puppies um, that you were maybe a little shy of or cautious yeah. of when it came to presenting it to the band because you weren't sure of how it was going to be received or it really didn't match the rest of what was going on. Yeah. And so this is a good example, actually, for people who think that Connect was like one of those, like the last album the puppies did was like, oh, the singer wanted to go one direction, the band wanted to go another direction. So the, the, the album sounds like two halves. And the bottom line is that the, the puppies all the way through our career from beginning to end was basically democratic. The band got to vote on the songs, the manager, the producers of the record and the label. Uh, so everyone was like, well, no, we think so we would do a list and we would whittle it down. And sometimes songs that I wanted to make on the record didn't make it. And sometimes songs were put on the record that I didn't agree with. But most 95 percent of it, I basically was very happy with the choices on the record. And so was everyone else. We all made those choices together as a democracy. So the idea that it's like it was one person's fault. No, it was everyone's fault. If you like the band, it was everyone's fault. If you don't like the band, it was everyone's fault. If you didn't like this record, if you didn't like this thing, it was everyone's fault. Everyone was responsible for what they brought to the table. And everyone was responsible for the shit that they brought to the table as well. But when I was, if I'd write a song, I would just give it to the, to the, uh, the producers and the labels and the thing and the band all at the same time. And then they go, well, that's that sounds like an orchestra needs to be on it. That's not that doesn't sound like sick puppies. And I go, all right, well, I guess that one's not making it on. And I try and put it in a different place. And I put all I just put all my ideas and all my songs and put them forward. And then we co-write and whatever. And it had just turned out the way it turned out. But no, I was never shy. I've never been shy in my fucking life. <laughs> shy about bringing a song to my. This is the funny thing. Am I shy about bringing a song to my fucking band? No. No, I'm not shy about bringing a song to my fucking mood. <laughs> so. Well, so because when we got cut off earlier, something that didn't recorded, you did mention that there was the one song like you, you hinted to right there with the symphony and everything else. And you were yeah. like, you had mentioned that in Tripolar, the last track being White Balloons, wasn't really like the rest of the album, which by the way, White Balloons, great fucking track. I'm talking to my sister for that one. Um, yeah. And so... Um, this one song, you were kind of hoping that it would be like a last track, yeah. some, you know, something very similar to what you guys did with White Balloons, and it ended up yeah. being shot down. But then yeah. I also I asked you, are you glad that that happened? Because that because what could have happened is okay, we'll put it in there, and then it kind like doesn't necessarily get half assed, but <clears throat> it's not necessarily your vision. And so now that you have it, because you also talked to me like when you have the money and you can you yeah. would actually like to record this song. So aren't you, are you glad that this thing, uh, this song did not I, I get no, Honestly, I have no emotion on it. I really hadn't thought about it until we just started talking about it. If we hadn't finished Connect with Under a Very Black Sky, which is kind of White Balloons Part 2, everyone kind of agreed that we needed to have a song like that. But my, for some reason, I think it might've just been because I wrote it by myself. I put it forward this idea that, that I'd written that sounded like Diorama from Silverchair at the beginning of the recording process. And they were like, dude, we just got off tour. We're a rock band. We had you going down as a single. And one of the first batches I gave this fucking orchestral fucking headache. And they were like, dude, we're a rock band. We're not going that direction. We're not going to make a whole fuck. I think they thought that I wanted to make the whole album an orchestra. And I was like, nah, it's just, an, did you listen to the other five songs that are heavy? That was just one song. And they're like, nah, we just, we just want to be clear. We're not going that way. And I'm like, and it was everyone was all every everyone was all fucking weird at the whole album cycle, that whole album. But 
um no uh, we had under a very the fucking connect has a bunch of soft weird fucking trippy songs that was what people didn't like about it half the album is weird and trippy and kind of more classic pop it's got some beach boy shit and it's got some fucking you know it's it's better songs technically but most people just wanted you're going down again so no i was very happy with i love connect the other people were like you go down where's the rock i was like dude okay so that's how it played out um but no i i, I like the thing that the, i i only have one regret with the band i'll tell you what the regret is i think i've mentioned it before when tripolar did polar opposite when we did the second polar opposite which was five songs and it had string sections and that i was in heaven i was like yes we're finally going to do our acoustic record we're finally there and van dyke parks who did orchestration for the beach boys and did the orchestrations on my favorite album diorama van dyke parks did an orchestration for odd one and it happened because i've always been a massive fan of van dyke parks the band and everyone knew that i was a big fan of that record and always wanted to have van dyke parks do something on one of my songs and Ross Hogarth, who was our engineer and who is a dear friend of mine, is a friend of Van Dyke Parks. So he was like, I'll just give him a call and I'll send him the song and I'll see if he's interested. And the next call that we got back was from Van Dyke the next day saying, I finished the arrangement. I got inspired. It's done. He was like, I heard the song and I just heard all the parts and I just wrote it out and it's all written down, but it's going to cost about ten to $12,000 to make because it's, it's an orchestra. Yeah. And we didn't have the budget. And everyone looked at me and was like, we don't have the budget for this, but we know that this is your bucket list thing. So basically, if you want to, you can be the one that says, we're going to take it out of the touring budget. We're going to move money around. And then if anything goes wrong later, it was very clear that it was like, if anything goes wrong and we don't have money for touring or something else down the line, that could happen. And it's going to be because of this. So do you want to pull the trigger? We're not going to say no, but we're not going to say yes. It's up to you. And I bitched out. I bitched the fuck out. I didn't pull the trigger and I said, I don't want to be responsible for something later on. I, I don't, I can't handle the pressure and I don't have the money to fucking supplement if anything goes wrong. It's all in one pile. So it really came down to money. And I was like, and in retrospect, now I look back and I'm like, we never would have had, we, now I know we wouldn't have had that problem, but I don't know because I'm on the other side. So when I'm there, I'm like, fuck, what if we have to go on? What if fucking Nickelback calls and says, come on tour at the drop of a dime and we don't have the money to hit the road straight away and it's my fault. I'll never forgive myself. So I didn't do it. And I and that that um, arrangement still exists. It's in Van Dyke's house on a desk somewhere. And I'm like, God, what would that have sounded like? And I'm hoping at some point I get enough money in the kitty to just call him and go here, just fucking make it. Let's just here's twelve grand. I just need to know what it sounds like. You know, start a, because let's start like, a goddamn GoFundMe, man. No, but it's not like that is not a good use of twelve grand. That is a vanity project max. That it's a vanity project. And the truth is, if I was going to get Van Dyke to do it, I'd do it on one of my new songs. I'd do it on a solo. That 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 the song that I ripped off Diorama. I would do that song for sure. So maybe, like, he'll, but I just yeah, remember, maybe he'll throw in the odd one for free. Maybe that'd be cool. But yeah, I, I remember I remember immediately regretting it and going, oh, I'm going to regret that. I'm going to regret it the rest of my life. There was that was not seeing Rage Against the Machine and one other personal one that I won't say. But there's only three regrets in my life. Next year. Four, next year. Next year. Regrets. February. And one of those is coming off the list. Knock on wood. Yep. We will finally no. see Rage Against the Machine <laughs> yes, next yes. year. Anyway, right, coming back, back to, to Alison James. So track five, Rooster. Sick Man. No, oh, we haven't even done Sick, sick Man yet. Well, sorry, no, sorry, sorry. We, remember, we did, we did it before. Uh, it make sure recording. we're recording. Are we Good. recording? Yep. So this is one of the three songs that reference heroin and its effects, including Junkhead and Godsmack. Something else that we noted, obviously, when we were record, not recording before, was that a lot of people thought that the song Godsmack by Alice in Chains was what inspired the name of the band, Godsmack. And I, I think I remember even for a while when I first got into radio, we I would say that on the air because I thought that that was something that a lot of people... Like you, you believed it, or that's that's what was understood is that their name came from mm -hmm. this track. I have since, again, I can't confirm any of this. Is that I heard that the story was actually uh, like somebody had like a like a um, like a cold sore or something, and then somebody joked that God smacked you in the face, and that was how God Smack got its name. But we'll we'll get into that when we get to the actual God Smack album. But then Cantrell said, "Quote Sick Man. I think Sick Man is not that bad." I thought most of the hassle would come from Junkhead and Godsmack. Those songs are put in sequence on the second side. Those five songs from Junkhead to Angry Chair for a reason. 
It's interesting when he talks about the second side because nobody really thinks of that now because obviously it was on a cassette tape. And, yeah. you know, when you know like CDs were a thing, uh, you know, yeah. early 90s, but that's how we would we would consider it, you know, side A such and a side good, B. Such a good time to be alive. <laughs> it said, so those songs are put in, on, in sequence on the second side, those five songs from Junkhead to Angry Chair for a reason because it tells a story. It starts out with a really young, naive attitude with Junkhead. Like, drugs are great, sex is great, rock and roll, yeah. Then it, as it progresses, there's a little bit of growing up and a little bit of realization of what it's about, and that ain't what it's about. I've been using this phrase a lot, but it makes a lot of sense. It's really easy to die. It's really hard to live. It takes a lot of guts to live. It doesn't take a lot of guts to die. Those five and sick man are the only ones talking about that type of mentality, meaning uh, referencing the drugs. The rest of the stuff... Is not that at all, which is how it's easy for us to roll right into one of the songs now, track six, Rooster, that is not about drug use, heroin, or anything like that, but there is a very deep meaning behind this one, and that meaning is it's the song that my wife was constantly asking for at the Alice in Chains concert. Is this Rooster? Is this Rooster? Is this it is Rooster? ironic that the hook the hook of this song, if it was if it was about drugs, yeah. is one of the dopest lines if it was Wee! gonna die i'm like it'd be a junky anthem if it was I mean, you're looking a at fucking... the lyrics you could almost even relate it yeah. to to that but it's it's clearly not so yeah it actually is written by cantrell to his father jerry cantrell senior who served in the vietnam war rooster was his childhood nickname cantrell said the song was the start of the healing process between my dad and i from all that damage that vietnam caused which i think is a great thing to write a song about but it ain't about drugs she Brandon just said that that's a great song. I want to. I want to make it. It is a great that. dude. I dude. I like the. Fuck you, man. <laughs> <laughs> I love the rooster, and I love the rooster. The first time that I really heard the rooster was when um, uh, Adam Gautier from Singer, uh, sorry, Adam Gautier, singer of Three Days Grace, sang it uh, acoustically at their shows, and it would crush. And I was like, damn, I never really paid that much attention to the song. It's dope. And now I get the song and I can listen to the song, but I can't listen to the album and I can't ah. listen to the band for more than one song. So every, fuck you. Just so fucking Rooster's the, the one song. All right. So in a 1999 interview or a 1992 interview, Cantrell, he was asked about whether he felt the song helped communicate with his father. And he said, quote, yeah, he's heard the song. He's only seen us play once. Of course, remember, this was, you know, 1992. And I played this song for him when we were in this club opening for Iggy Pop. I'll never forget it. He was standing in the back and he heard all the words and stuff. Of course, I was never in Vietnam, and he won't talk about it. But when I wrote this, it felt right. Like these were things he might have felt or thought. And I remember when we played it, he was back by the soundboard, and I could see him. He was back there with this big gray Stetson <laughs> and his cowboy boots. He's a total Oklahoma man. It's and funny. at the end, he took his hat off and just held it in the air. And he was crying the whole time. This wow. song means a lot to me. A lot. Wow, that is fantastic, isn't it? That's that's and so much. Shim that's almost. Hates it. <laughs> Track that's seven, Junkhead. Along with Godsmack, Cantrell said that these are the most openly honest songs about drug use. Okay, that's fair. I mean, that's pretty straightforward. Junkhead is like, hey, we're on drugs. Here's a song about it. Moving pretty on much. to track eight, Dirt. Yeah, and uh, Cantrell, he said, uh, the words Lane put to it were so heavy, I've never given him something and not thought it was going to be the most badass thing I was going to hear. Dope. That'd be nice. That'd be a nice relationship to have with someone when you're writing songs. Speaking about the album cover, Staley said, the album co this album cover, I like to refer to it as Revenge. The song Dirt was written to a certain person who basically buried my ass. So the woman on the album cover is kind of the portrayal of that person being sucked down into the dirt instead of me. <laughs> it's funny. It actually says that he laughed in the interview and that made me laugh when he said it. The picture is the spitting image of her and that wasn't even planned. Actually, I was pretty angry about it when I first saw it. She's not happy about it either. It was really eerie. Fucking great. That is great. To just be that on the nose, to literally be like, here's an album cover. There's going to be millions of copies in people's houses. I hope you fucking choke on it, you bitch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, track nine going on to Godsmack. It's all kind of the same stuff with Junkhead. It's, you know, the references to heroin use. Now, track 10. This one's kind of cool. So it's... This is one of those songs that has a lot of different names. You'll see it if you're on Spotify. It's listed as Untitled. 
Um, it's also listed as uh, intro or iron gland. Um, and if you if you listen to the song, you know exactly what it is. And it's uh, it started out as a riff that Cantrell would play that would just annoy the rest of the band. So he right. created the song, and it's really short. I had I had so many of those riffs, by the way. So many. Did any of them was, make it into fun. a song? Uh, yeah. All the hits, yeah, right? Yeah, one of them did. No, one of them did, actually. And I What's... won't say... We, I mean, I don't know if I should say which one, but it... Um, say it. Yeah, say actually, it. I will. Yeah, um, <laughs> it was Connect. The riff for Connect. I've told... Uh, the funny thing is I've told the story, and I used to tell the story, uh, that that is one of my oldest riffs. And it's a Celtic riff, and it's a, but it's in a, it's in a Celtic vibe, and it was one of the first riffs that I ever figured out because it was on open tuning. And every album and every time we would, I would bring this riff in, and it got to the point where the band. The thing is that when we used to tell the story about how this the song, I, I'd had it for years, I'd had the riff for years. Um, and they'd say, yeah, and then we finally put it into a song. The thing that we never said was that the band hated the riff. They were like, dude fucking Celtic, you know what I mean? Like we're a rock band and you keep bringing this Celtic riff in, it's never going to make it into a song. And then one day I did it and the and Tim and Antonina caught it, caught it and were like, that's cool. What can we do with that? And then they turned it into something that was more pop and more straightforward and it made it on the song and they just had to choke on it. <laughs> <laughs> they just had to deal with it because, and the song is amazing. The song is great. They love the song. But they used to fucking hate the riff. It'd be like again with that stupid little riff. So, well, and so like with this one, so he 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 created the song for the album. Again, it it, it could be uh, uh, untitled or Iron Gland. Um, and then he promised that he would never play the song again. It's now used as their intro at concerts. Like that's, that's what funny, plays before it? the band comes out, and it actually it features Tom Araya of Slayer on vocals. Oh wow, cool! That's very cool, isn't it? All right. Well, track 11, Hate to Feel, one of the two, one of two songs that Staley wrote by himself for the first time ever, Cantrell said a lot of pride, he said he had a lot of pride in seeing Lane grow as a guitarist and songwriter to create something so heavy. He all, he'd always been so honest in his songs, which is like all of us, we don't bullshit in our music, we always pushed each other to say it as it needed to be said. We've always been fully for letting it all out. That's nice. That must be nice. <laughs> well, you don't feel the same way about your music? No, I'm just saying that must be really nice to have four guys all in the same room saying, nah, man, let's put it all out there. Let's fucking do everything. Let's go for it. It must be great. 12. Like, go ahead, like, Brandon. Sounds like there's something else you need. No, I didn't say anything like that. Get off of your Never chance. said anything like that. Okay. All right. Track 12 is Angry Chair. Uh, the other song Staley wrote by himself and Cantrell said, it's such a brilliant song. I'm very proud of Lane for writing it. When I've stepped up vocally in the past, he's been so supportive. And here's a fine example of him stepping up with the guitar and writing a masterpiece. Masterpiece. That is Sitting nice. Sitting nice. in my angry chair. You and me, we're going to do a duet. Would. The song was featured on the soundtrack for the movie Singles. Once again, I don't really know the album Dirt, and I don't know the movie Singles. Brandon? Singles was, it, it was kind of, it was Hollywood jumping on the grunge bandwagon is, is, is what Singles was. It, I right. think it came out in 93. It, it features some of the grunge acts. I think like Eddie Vedder is in there. This is one that I thought would be kind of cool since we're so heavily invested in grunge here for the beginning of History of Rock. Um, do which one I'm not saying movies. that in the sense of grunge was the beginning of the History of Rock. It's just where we started this podcast. Um is that when you make it here to the states, we should find a movie theater and do a screening of singles, and but we oh. should do a marathon because we had also mentioned Airheads earlier as well. Oh, so yeah. we would have because because there's there's certain movies and the back to back movies for me were always Airheads and Empire Records. And as we referenced yeah. in the, the previous Nirvana episode, we talked about yeah, Rex yeah, Manning yeah. Day, which was back on on April eighth. Um, yes. So I thought that that would be something that we could do if we could find, you know, when you get here to the to the beautiful city of El Paso, we could yes, maybe find yes. a movie theater and we'll do we'll do some sort of a of a, of a showing there. So yeah. here you go. The song Wood was written as a tribute for drum roll please, 
Andrew Wood of Mother Love Bone, which is where the whole history of rock started. Um, is t- speaking of Mother Love Bone. Now, Cantrell has said of the song, quote, I was thinking a lot about Andrew at the time. We always had a great time when we did hang out, much like Chris Cornell and I do. There was never really a serious moment or conversation. It was all fun. Andy was a hilarious guy, full of life, and it was really sad to lose him. But I always hate people who judge the decisions others make. So it was directed towards people who pass judgments. Hmm. Very good. If I could, would you? That's how, that's, that, how that wraps up. Now we can get into the reviews. I, I, I've mentioned this on the podcast before. I really enjoy um, reading like negative reviews about uh, about albums. I yeah. wasn't really able to find any because this is a masterpiece. This album. Well, you should have called me. Am- <laughs> uh, I mean, for the most part, it's it's. And I, I wanted to. F- I'd like to find original reviews as well. Like we talked about with Nirvana, most of the the, the print publications. They just let that one slide. It wasn't until all of a sudden it was like the biggest goddamn song with uh, like "Smells Like Teen Spirit" was on every radio yeah. station. I think and on at MTV. that point, people at, at that point people might have been scared to say anything negative about a big grunge record coming out. They were like, "Oh no, grunge is a thing. We got to don't don't you know what I mean?" Like, but don't you think there's always that contrarian that's always like, "Oh, like everybody is loving this, but there's got to be something wrong with it." But a lot of the a lot of the reviews, which I wasn't able to really find any from that time. Um, but but they you know, it's like peppered here and there. A lot of it has to do with the subject matter. A lot of it, it like somebody yeah. here says in a retrospective review, Steve Huey of All Music said, "Dirt is Alice in Chains' major artistic statement and the closest they ever came to recording a flat out masterpiece. masterpiece." Masterpiece. It's a primal, sickening howl from the depths of Lane Staley's heroin addiction and one of the most harrowing concept albums ever recorded. Not every song on Dirt is explicitly about heroin, but Jerry Cantrell's solo written contributions, nearly half the album, effectively maintain the thematic coherence. Nearly every song is imbued with the mor- uh, morbidity, mor- morbidity, God, I can barely say that, self-disgust and or resignation of a self-aware yet powerless addict. Nice. There's a lot of big words in there. But I mean, for, I for say, the most part, this one was very morbidity. well received. And, and like we had, uh, shut up. Uh, <laughs> like we, we, how we had commented, um, about how, uh, Allison Chains was, I mean, you go back to Mother Love Bone and then it was in 91 when Nirvana really broke through and that was kind of the, the smack to the face of the grunge movement for the rest of the country. That was and the Will Smith. That was the Will Smith right there. Um, <laughs> although that, there's a lot more, you know, power coming on my slap. A little He's, more closed fist action. Yeah. He, 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 how he slapped <laughs> anyway um because allison chains because you had their big hit wood on the album facelift which came out in 1990 and that got good airplay like that yeah, was yeah. played a yeah. lot but i think it was it wasn't it, it was pre people kind of being like oh all these bands from seattle are now getting signed can you believe i'm going yes. to the next thing maybe uh, no 11 grammys yeah, Alison Chains has been nominated for eleven Grammys and never won. Yeah, I'd yeah. be pissed. I'd be like, "Stop fucking calling! Stop <laughs> calling me! Stop wasting my time! I'm gonna Will Smith my way through the rest of the Grammys. I'm not coming. I'm not coming. Stop I actually, calling me. I, gosh, I have it here. I had the list of what everything. Uh, and I think no, was- that's depressing. It's depressing because they should have won one. They should have won a Grammy by now. Um. Uh, yeah. Here it is. So in 92, Man in the Box was nominated for Best Hard Rock Performance with Vocals. Dirt was also nominated in 93. In 95, you had uh, Jar of Flies was nominated. And then they had, a you know, I Stay Away, Grind, Again, Get Born Again, Check My Brain, A Looking in View. like And that is, some of this obviously is later stuff. When you get to Check My Brain, that was when they brought William Duvall into the band, kind of replacing Lane Staley. Uh, who I, yeah. I think he does a phenomenal job. Like he does he, an amazing you, job. You want to talk about bringing in a guy who's able, especially with the band, with the history of Alice in Chains, with the type of yeah. voice, with the type of music that they're creating. I thought that he was a perfect fit, and I think he's just yeah. done a fantastic job with them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, they've they've been nominated eleven times, and they have not. Uh, they have not won. Dude, I'd be you really. You'd be like, just I. I genuinely would say, stop calling. I wouldn't be like, oh, maybe this is the year. After that many years, you'd be like, dude, I'm fucking. I'm, I'm old. I'm tired. We've sold the records. We've done the shit. We've gone through. We're on our second singer. Fuck your Grammy. Fuck your Grammy. 
So some continued education for you guys. There's Dirt Umentary, the story of Alice in Chains, the lane years. You can find that actually over on YouTube. And again, you can go find a lot of the interviews from these bands on YouTube. I love going back. Oh, there's there's one that's great. So it was, what was the name of the damn theme park Johnny Knoxville did a movie on? I always forget um, the name of the theme park. But when you look it up, when that movie was coming out, I, I just looked into it. Oh, Action Point. Is the name of the movie. Um, but the name of the theme park was something else. There's a whole Headbangers Ball episode with Allison Chains in that theme park. Like, that's where they're at. And they're on the slides. They're running around with inner tubes. They're having that's a blast. So that's so great. And it's, and it's interesting because it brought up um, a memory that I have of um, one of the... Uh, gosh, it was... It was, it was a, a little like mini concert that we threw on at a local water park here in El Paso called um, Wet and Wild Water World. Say that five times fast. And it was the band stitched up hard. Wet and Wild Water World, 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 Wet and Wild Water World. Yeah, yeah it didn't really work. Uh, I was you, trying. I tried. At least I gave it a shot. Stumbled through it. You did. Wet and Wild Water World, 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 Wet and Wild Water World. Yeah, but you're a professional. <laughs> yeah, but you're a professional. That's the nicest thing anybody's ever said to me. Um, so, yeah. So, it was... Uh, um, I just want to do it. I just want to do it now. It's all I can fucking think about. Go. <laughs> wet and wild water world. Wet and wild. No, can't do it. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> we, can get you, we can get you on the one with... Um, um, I'm not the pheasant plucker. I'm the pheasant plucker son. I'm, at, I'm only plucking I'm pheasants. I'm plucking pheasants till the, pheasant 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 the pheasant plucker comes. Yeah. I'm not, the, I'm not a pheasant plucker. I'm the pheasant plucking son. I'm the pheasant plucker's son, and I'm only plucking pheasant until the pheasant plucker comes. I, I used to be good at these. I am out of practice. <laughs> I'm not the pheasant plucker. I'm the pheasant plucking son. And now, fuck. I'm, I'm not the really pheasant plucker. Convinced. I'm the pheasant plucker's son. I'm only plucking pheasants until the pheasant plucker comes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah. But on the, let's go to September 24th. Can we go to it. September 24th, please? Yeah. Hold, no. oh, 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 anyway, but real quick on that side note. So it was Wet and Wild Water World where we were at, and it was band <laughs> stitched up heart. And um, they were out there, and they like they once they they left the stage, they were all about the water rides, man. They're running yeah. around with inner tubes, all tatted up, and they were just having the time of their life. Which takes awesome. me back to that Allison Chains. I, it might still be on YouTube if you look up the Headbangers Ball episode with Allison Chains with that goddamn theme park name that I can't think of right now. But now well, we are going to go into September twenty fourth uh, on this date. September 29th, 1992, it was actually five days before the Sci-Fi Channel launched with a broadcast of Star Wars. So Star Trek's creator Gene Roddenberry and author Isaac Asimov, uh, they were among those on the initial advisory board, but they'd both died by the time the channel finally launched on September 24th, 1992. Uh, so, um, somebody recalled that the first thing that was on the screen was dedicated to the memories of Isaac Asimov and Gene Roddenberry. Leonard Nimoy was master of ceremonies at the channel's launch party held at the Hayden Planetarium in Manhattan. Asimov's widow was there. Roddenberry's widow was there. And the first program that was shown on the network was Star Wars. It's fantastic. Imagine it has to be, it has to be Star Wars. All right. So now is it, um, going, what are we doing next? The three songs. Um, we can't forget the three songs. We do have to get to the three songs, but also, do you want to go run through the uh, the numbers here really quick? I want to make sure that we yes, plug these right. at the end for anybody just considering. In case. Yes, considering that we are talking about some heavy issues, uh, it's related to drug use and substance addiction with Kurt Cobain, and actually pretty much most of the bands, uh, and suicide as a result, or uh, suicide or a drug overdose from these issues. It is very important to remember a very important concept, which is just because the music is cool doesn't mean that the subject matter is cool. And if you are struggling with any of these issues, uh, feel free and confident to call certain places, which we are going to give you the number for. One is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration's National Helpline is 1-800-662-HELP. Help. It's 1-800-662-HELP. You can also reach out to the National Suicide Prevention Line at 1-800-723-8255. Those will be in the description on YouTube if you're watching on YouTube. Um, because it's very important to remember that this stuff, it's nice to have cool music, but there's cool music about a lot of subject matters. This is not a cool subject matter and it ain't cool to go through. And if you need help, just call, reach out and get it because it's there waiting for you right now. 
Yeah, and and it's something that I always tell everybody too is that especially if you're going through some shit or anything, you know, I, like our social medias, you can always you can drop a line anytime. You know, you can find me at the real Brandalorian on Twitter, or anything like that. Even if you just need somebody to, uh, you know, make you laugh by being an by being an idiot, I'm I'm always you can able say to wet do and wild. That. You can say wet and wild water world five times real. Quick, I will do, I tell you what, idiot. It, I, yeah, an idiot. If you have any problems, I can I'll just go wet and wild water world, wet and wild water world. By yeah, the way, Action world. Park. Was the name of the actual park there that you go. There uh, you go. was that the craziness? But um, yeah. So and what are the uh, three songs? See, isn't it? What are we gonna do with these three songs? Oh, Picking three songs from now, I don't even fucking like. I'm honest, man. You can have them. You can have them because I, I I could literally pick three. I'd be like, I don't even know what I don't even know the good bits about them. But I'd see, pick Godsmack just because I like that band. <laughs> <laughs> but see, and and for me, there there was five singles I could I, like, it, it, not even a single. But damn, that river is such a good goddamn song. I think yeah. I, you have to get Rooster. I think that that one yeah. has to be on there. I yeah, think that that's a Rooster. definite one. I think definitely. Yeah. Oh Jesus! Like I, I, I mean, Shim does. Yeah, not go ahead. What? No, I know, no, I know you ahead. don't. Sorry. Um, yeah, no. You gotta have Rooster. It's one of the best songs ever. I know, you but I, I like. It's like I, I, for me right now, it's if between, we if we don't put Rooster on the playlist, every woman listening to the it's gonna be like, "What? Well, which band is this? I don't this? understand. Who's this? It's just it's three albums that make me three songs that make me feel like I'm not very nice, and then it goes to fucking yeah. Soundgarden <laughs> or Nirvana. Um, Nirvana, because mm. like the way like them bones, man, like the way that starts. Yeah, man, them bones. You're right, dude. That's got to be on there. Go ahead, come really? on. What else? But the, but I also like Angry Jar sitting. In well, then that should be. Yeah, yeah, but what about Wood? Could have been Wood. So here, I'm I'm gonna leave this one. I'm gonna leave this one up to the audience because I can't. There's no way I can pick. We have to pick Good. three songs. So maybe I I know uh, through Anchor I can put up like a poll and I'll put up the options that I have. Or maybe I'll pick five or six from this album. I'll put them up there and then whichever three. And maybe that's what we start doing. Maybe we don't pick. Maybe we start letting the audience pick. Because sure you want to do this, that? Well, because at this point, I know that it, it's more than just my mom listening. Hi, mom. Look, you got to. This is a one-off, all right. I just happen to really not like Alice in Chains. I like pretty much all the other bands we're going to be talking about, and I can. But we give, could. But no, how about just, this? But we could. Uh, I mean, maybe we don't make it exclusive to the audience, but we could get their input on the song. Yeah, that's I mean, that's definitely right, something yeah. that we could yeah. do. So oh. I'll, I'll I'll put up some options for Alice in Chains. There, I'll pick five or six from this album. And then whichever three get the most votes, they're the yeah. ones that will make it into um, playlist. The ones that make it into the playlist. So Excellent. On, on that note, I think we've covered on everything note, there, Shim, and I'm glad that we, we got are. through it. I know that this was absolute torture recording these two episodes because it's a, an album that Shim absolutely despises. <laughs> it's just, the worst album ever made. I can't <laughs> no, that was Alice's restaurant. Actually... <laughs> See what I did there? Okay, cool. Anyway, his name is Brandon. He's the DJ. His name is Shim. He's the rock star. We'll check you out next week. Next week. God damn it. They'll fucking wet my water park. 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 Whatever. Class is me. I love lamp. I like leaks. Brick, are you just looking at things and saying that you love them? Okay, bye.